This morning I'm going to be sharing with you a message that I'll entitle a new set of glasses. If you were here or watched us online last week, you heard Pastor Brad Rogers present a wonderful message about a time when Jesus healed a blind person and he reminded us that we all have spiritual blind spots that we need God to remove. Well, you could think of today as being like a sequel to that message. I want to tell you about what happened to me, an eye condition that I developed about roughly 25 years ago. It was double vision. The medical term is strabismus. Strabismus can come in different forms. You can have double vision because your eyes point out differently from each other or cross-eyed. You can have double vision because one eye points up and the other points down. Double vision can occur in children, even in newborns. And it can onset at adult life, which was my case. And in fact, uh, my actual condition was that my right eye was pointing a little bit lower than my left eye. The further out I got, the more the gap was and the more blur. Now, what caused it was that, as you probably know, there are lots of tiny little muscles that control the movement of the eye. And the lower muscles of my right eye had become a little bit too strong, stronger than the upper muscles could counteract. And therefore, that dragged my right eye down a bit. The ultimate solution for my condition was that a specialist at a specialty eye and ear hospital in Pittsburgh performed a delicate but relatively painless surgery that just slightly weakened that lower muscle pulling me down so that the upper muscle was equal in strength and I could get a level sight even with both eyes. But before we went through that surgery, my local ophthalmologist confirmed the diagnosis by prescribing for me a pair of eyeglasses with the right eye using a prism to bend the light slightly upwards. And when I could see level with that prism, my condition was confirmed. And that prism proved to be the answer, at least temporarily before the surgery, to seeing things clearly. Keep in mind this concept of a lens that is a prism, because we're going to come back to that. We're first going to be taking a look at a passage of scripture. Actually, a very short one. Oftentimes, when we study the Word of God, we take a chunk of it, a story or an extended session. But today, we're going to study the Bible in a different way. We're going to be doing it by looking at one little tiny sentence, one phrase, in fact. And we're going to be exploring it in detail. It's as if we're going to put it under a microscope and look at every detail of it. So... Here's what we're going to be reading from the book of Ephesians, a letter by the Apostle Paul, and his he wrote to a group of Christians in the first century. At the start of the book, he is telling them about who Christ is and what he did and what a difference it makes for us. And when he gets to the 18th verse, he launches into a prayer, a prayer for the people reading and really by extension for all of us nearly 2,000 years later. So this will be our sole focus for today. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. It reads like this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, let's just think about this opening phrase of that one verse. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And let's look at that carefully. Now, on first glance, it appears to be nonsense. How can a heart have eyes? Now, I know that The Apostle Paul lived in a time of primitive medicine before the developments in our modern science of, for example, the MRI and CT scan capability, which allows us to look deep inside the human body and see its functioning. We can see what the heart is like. But even in the ancient world, 
people knew enough to discern that the heart was an organ deep inside our body that had something to do with blood. They didn't understand the full circulatory system, but they, they knew that the heart was this organ that pumped. And, and as a result, it makes no sense, initially at least, for Paul to speak about the eyes of the heart. Eyes, after all, must be located on the outside of a body. Our eyes are in these little sockets mounted on the head, and eyes are worthless unless their view is unobstructed of the outside world. What good would it do for a heart to have eyes that would only look at the inside of the chest cavity and the inner part of the rib cage? That would be pointless. Ah. Uh, but if we understand this in a different perspective, we realize that Paul is simply doing what generation after generation and culture after culture have done, which is to seize upon the concept of the heart, not as that organ, thump, 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 in our chest, but rather as expressive of that which is our true self, our inner self. It is the heart of the matter. Our heart People of all cultures have thought of as being who you really are. Even to today, with our sophistication in medical knowledge, we still talk about the heart not as a, an internal organ, but as our real self. Why, you know, two decades ago, the big Oscar-winning film Titanic, you remember Celine Dion crooning the title song, My Heart Will Go On, right? She's not talking about her cardiac condition. She's talking about her memories and her affection for that young man who gave his life to save hers when the big boat went under. That's what we use too. The word heart means our affection or our inner thoughts or our inner attitudes. I guarantee you, a week from today, we're going to hear a lot about hearts and they have nothing to do with the circulatory system. It'll all be about our love and affection. That's what Paul's talking about. So when he's talking about the eyes of your heart, clearly that is the heart he's referring to. Well, what about this concept of the eyes being enlightened? Let's think about eyes for a moment. Eyes are simply conduits. They are like pipes. They take the visual impressions light and all the things light reveals and they send those through the pupil and the optic nerve to the brain. Eyes in themselves are just simple conduits. It is the brain that has to make sense of all the light impulses striking it. When an infant is born, when you and I came into the world and we opened our eyes for the first time, unless we had a, a rare congenital condition of some sort or a birth defect, our eyes worked fine in that they let the light into the brain, but the poor, unformed and unsophisticated brain could not figure out all of, all of that stimuli. What, what is all this stuff? It, it just came at us until gradually over time, the brain began to process things and form them together into patterns and eventually to recognize the face of our mother and our father or our own fingers and toes and we began, began to see things in a pattern and we began to make sense of them. That's what Paul is talking about that our eyes might be enlightened in other words that our mind might figure out how to see and make sense of things and actually all of life comes at us unexplained. It's just experiences and stimuli and it is our mind that has to figure out and categorize and allow us to process and make sense out of those experiences of life and it's necessary to do that or else all of life is just chaotic. Oh, I remember well the day, Stephen, I'm sure you had a day like this too. It was the first day of the uh, classes of my second year in graduate school. And I got my reading lists for my various classes. 
And I was entering into my first introductory class in Hebrew. So I went to the campus bookstore and I bought my Hebrew Bible and I took it back to my dorm room and I opened it up. And it was just chicken scratchings, page after page of meaningless little symbols all over the place. To my untutored mind, it was just chaos until under the tutelage of a gifted professor, I began to make sense out of all that chaos on those pages. And I began to discern that those little scratchings were actually letters that formed together words, that formed together sentences, and I began to be able to read it. That's the process that our mind must go through. We begin to learn and we begin to understand. So when Paul is saying that he is praying that the eyes of our heart might be enlightened, he's really praying that we might learn the gradual process of seeing the world in the correct way through God's perspective, ultimately, is his purpose. So, what we often talk about today, it's actually not a word that's found directly in the Bible, but it's become a helpful term to understand, is the term worldview. Have you ever heard that term? It means how you organize the data of the world, how you make sense of it. And there are a lot of different worldviews out there. And they are competing with one another. And here are several notable ones. There's the worldview. It's been around a little over a century and a half. Developed by a man named Karl Marx. In the Marxist worldview, all of human experience is interpreted and seen purely as class warfare. This group fighting this group over power and wealth, and this group gets on top and they oppress this group, and then that group has a revolution, and it's the same kind of worldview in slightly different terms that the leaders of the current Black Lives Matter follow, they look at the world as all about a conflict between races. One race trying to fight against or oppress or gain uh, uh, influence over another race, and that's how they see the world. That, that's it. The 1619 Project that the New York Times has promoted to schools has the same view of American history. Well, it's just all about racial conflict. That's one worldview. A second worldview is the Eastern religion worldview of Hinduism and Buddhism, which simply thinks of life as an endless cycle of living and dying and pain, and, and you just keep on coming back, reincarnated, or going through the unending repetition. Did any of you happen to watch the replay on TV last Tuesday night of the Bill Murray film Groundhog Day? when the poor guy has to keep reliving the same day over and over again. Well, that's kind of the Eastern worldview. Oh, yeah, that's all there is. Oh, then there's the very uh, dangerous worldview of the Islamists who are convinced that every human being is obligated to follow every last instruction of the Prophet Muhammad or there are severe consequences. Ultimately, if you will not obey... You can be killed as an infidel. That's the Islamist worldview. Then there's the materialist or secular worldview, very influential today, that says life is all about just gaining money and power and pleasure and avoiding pain because you're going to die and it's all gone and everything is meaningless anyway, but you just live for the moment and you try to get, get, get. That's the materialist worldview. And then there's the Christian worldview, which is what we teach and commend to you, and invite you to grow into, just as the Apostle Paul does, and understand things through God's perspective, and the Apostle Paul, you know, lived in a time before Western society had figured out the technique of taking glass and shaping it in such a way that it could correct vision, but I think if Paul had lived during a time when eyeglasses or spectacles were available, he might have chosen that image for Ephesians 1 18 and said I pray that you'll put on a new set of glasses to allow you via the correct prism to see the world from God's perspective well now I'm going to tell you about a man a neurosurgeon by the name of Dr. Lee Warren 
who received an excellent medical education at one of our finest institutions and went through a very rigorous residency at a top hospital. Then for a while was a physician and a combat surgeon with the U.S. Army in Iraq and then went into private practice. And uh, Lee Warren took upon himself, as is natural, kind of the mindset, the worldview, you might say, of his peers, of other surgeons, parenthetically. Although this is somewhat of a generalization, typically the different medical specialists reflect different personality types. Uh, the way a person is and the way their mind thinks often channels them towards the type of medicine. Family practice doctors and pediatricians are usually really strong in empathy and caring. Those who are pathologists and researchers well, they're usually introverts. They'd rather be in a laboratory with specimens rather than deal with real people. And, and then there are surgeons. So, oh, surgeons tend to be strong-willed, type A, confident, even cocky. They are the ones who think of themselves as the fix-it artists. You know, that's what they do. We get in. We fix it and we get out. You might even call them highly educated mechanics or plumbers. You know, a mechanic wants to figure out what's wrong with the engine and why it's rattling and fix it. And a plumber wants to figure out why the sink is dripping and fix it. And surgeons have that kind of can-do attitude. And they're usually very driven. They're often... Well, kind of like the competitive athletes of the medical community. You know, they're going to win. If Vince Lombardi had gone into medicine, he would have been a surgeon. Win. Got to win. And winning for a surgeon typically is a successful operation. And losing for a surgeon is a, is a not successful operation. And the worst defeat of all, like losing the Super Bowl by 50 points, would be if a patient dies. Well, this is the kind of attitude. This is the way surgeons think. And Lee Warren, of course, grasped and began to look at his practice and his medical activities through that lens of, I'm the one to fix problems. And he had a lot of success and a lot of problems he was able to solve or greatly help his patients with. Oh, but then there was one opponent a particularly virulent and aggressive form of brain cancer that he just couldn't seem to beat. It was terrible. And it was frustrating to Dr. Warren, who had this mindset that his job was to win and to fix a problem, and he couldn't seem to fix this one. And not only did he grieve over the pain of his patients and their families, but he also struggled with dealing with all these defeats and taking it personally. And even he began to question the childhood faith that he'd been given in Sunday school that said, oh, God is a God of love. And if you're a good person, God will take care of you. And, and yet, thankfully, unlike some, he did not give up his faith because it didn't seem to fit the evidence, but rather he persevered and he kept thinking and asking the hard questions and praying and seeking the scriptures and talking with others and attempting to make sense out of both the vicious disease he had to fight and the reality of God. And he finally came to a profound conclusion. You could say that his childhood faith grew up to deal with the real world. And his book, I've Seen the End of You, what a powerful personal journey that I think you would find tremendously helpful, whatever your profession is, because folks, we all have to deal with life and we all will have to face serious challenges at times. So how does our faith help us in that way? Coincidentally, Dr. Warren also had adult onset strabismus. And he was fitted with a prism lens. And he discovered in looking through that prism that it bent the light enough that he could see 
clearly. And that's actually a metaphor or image he refers to in his book. In talking about the process that we must go through if we as Christians are going to come to see the world correctly through God's eyes, through that prism of scripture and here's what he says the process we need to go through is like bending the light of our current circumstances in such a way that we can see God's presence in the moment despite the outcome at the very end of his book this is from the last page this is where he arrived at faith aligns what you think you're seeing with reality it shifts your focus from the problem to the promise. Faith doesn't keep you from having problems. It just gives a clearer view of how God is responding to them. Much of what Dr. Warren came to understand, the refining, the prisming, the, the correcting of his understanding, came about through his interaction with various patients. In fact, the book is filled with real life stories. Yeah, they're incredible. I could not put the book down. Many of you who have read it felt that same experience. These just pull you in and you're one with these patients and their families. Well, I've got to tell you about one of the stories that had a special impact. The patient's name was Rupert. He was uh, a high school teacher in his late 30s, beloved by his students, devoted family man, had some children, committed to his wife, deeply involved in his Christian faith. Rupert had been having recurring sinus infections for a period of time. And uh, his family doctor and then the uh, specialist he was referred to could not figure out why. So ultimately, Dr. Warren was brought in. A scan and other tests revealed the worst possible scenario. A growing brain tumor, cancerous. Dr. Warren thought the only thing he could do to at least buy Rupert a little bit of time and potentially slow down this aggressive and usually fatal cancer was to do immediate emergency surgery, which he scheduled for the next morning. When he got into the brain that next day in the surgical suite when as another author another neurosurgeon has called it air hits the brain when the skull was opened everything went wrong the cancer was far more widespread than even the scan had indicated his tiny blood vessels in his brain began to burst they were as thin as tissue paper. They had been corroded by the aggressive cancer. Everything fell apart. All of his vital signs dropped. There was nothing that the surgical team and Dr. Warren could think of to do. And Rupert did not survive the operation. And not only was it a heartbreak to have to tell the family that the surgery had failed, it also caused Dr. Warren to go through times of self-punishment what did I do wrong he replayed the operation again and again oh, is there anything I could have done differently and then to make things worse a few days later his office manager of his practice informed him that Rupert's family had made an appointment to see him that day he was dreading this Wondering if they would be angry at him, blame him, maybe even threaten to sue. And as much as he dreaded that appointment, what he experienced stunned him. When he went into the consulting room, the family gently told him what had happened the night before the surgery. They had gathered around Rupert's bedside and had prayed and he, Rupert, the one facing brain surgery the next day, had prayed, God, I ask you to either heal me completely or to take me to heaven. I'm ready to go with you if it's your time. The one thing I do not want is to live in a weakened and disabled state that would burden my family. And so they all join in affirming that prayer of trusting Rupert into God's hands. And then they thanked Dr. Warren for being an instrument of God's purpose and plan. He couldn't believe it. And then this family asked if they could pray for him that God would use him in his care 
of his other patients and families. It was a profound reorienting experience, like he'd just been given a whole different prison. And in fact, it was repeated experiences that caused him to look in a whole different way at his profession and at life itself. Perhaps, he began to think, perhaps trying to hold on to every last second of mortal life isn't the most important thing. And perhaps his career as a doctor was not ultimately about his personal won and loss scoreboard. And perhaps God had a bigger plan than anything we know and his plan is greater and better. And this perspective opened up his spiritual, mental eyes. And here is what he says. I stopped thinking of health care as the battle between life and death. Rather, I now saw it as the opportunity to help people live life fully while they have it and to help them approach death bravely when they must because length of life, I now saw, was not as important as quality of life. Let me conclude. Our current problems, whatever we're facing, are not, no matter how big and overwhelming and impossible they seem, they are not the ultimate reality. Whatever you're dealing with, a serious health issue, an insolvable financial problem, the loss of a marriage, the death of someone you love, a global pandemic, a seemingly unsolvable political conflict, Whatever, all of these are temporary. They won't last. Here's what's eternal. God loves you personally and intimately. God is with you right now and always. God has a plan and a purpose for you. And God, if you will trust him, will, you can be assured, take you to be with him forever. That, my friends, is seeing reality through the proper prism of the word of God. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment in prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you that you came not only to do the great work of reconciling and renewing us in fellowship to our Father, but also helping us to see what real true reality is thank you that you work in our minds through the teaching of your word and the testimony of your people to give us a new prism and a new understanding lord grant to us that as we face all the ups and downs of life we may see through your eyes for it's in christ's name that we pray amen